we have uh, probably one of the best uh, moderators ever. Uh, you know he has a firm hand. His name is uh, Professor Jason Scorza. Uh, so he will be uh, in charge. He needs no introduction. Everyone knows him. Uh, Professor Scorza is uh, an important element at Farley Dickinson University, no doubt. Uh, has been uh, provost, uh, has uh, really uh, developed uh, the global aspect of the university. And uh, uh, I must say that for this particular conference, uh, uh, throughout the two days, both Roxton and uh, Oxford, has been uh, quietly but very efficiently uh, the orchestra director in many ways of, uh, of the activities here. So uh, I leave you with uh, uh, the moderator for this final session, Professor Jason Scorza, and he will introduce the speakers for the, for the session. Professor Scorza. Thank you very much, Alvaro, and thanks all of you for bearing with us uh, through the little twists and turns we've had these past two days. Um, we are back on schedule, as they say in this country, um, and uh, I, I promise you will, you will have your lunch, and I promise our hosts at Trinity College that we'll be out of their hair um, by 3 p.m. Uh, it is my great honor uh, to introduce our four panelists. You see only three, but there is a, uh, another panelist to come. Uh, firstly, Michael Stevenson, uh, who is a thought leader and innovator in the field of global education, uh, who works in the intersection of the compelling fields of education and business. He currently consults to governments, universities, school systems, and others, focusing on systematic approaches to talent development and business innovation. Michael's research interests include strategies for preparing exceptional graduates to take on the challenges facing 21st century business. Uh, and we went, uh, uh, Michael Adams and I met uh, Michael Stevenson several years ago when he was head of uh, global education at Cisco. Uh, secondly, I would like to introduce um, uh, Dr. Alan Goodman who is the sixth president of the Institute of International Education. Previously, Dr. Goodman was executive dean of the School of Foreign Service and professor at uh, Georgetown University. He has also served as presidential briefing coordinator for the director of central intelligence at the Carter administration, was the first American professor to lecture at the Foreign Affairs College of Beijing, helped create the first US academic exchange program with the Moscow Diplomatic Academy for the Association of Professional Schools and International Affairs, and is on, I suspect, several watch lists even to this day. <laughs> Professor Dame Glynis Breakwell is one of Europe's leading social psychologists. She is an active public policy advisor and researcher specializing in leadership, identity processes, and risk management. She has nationally championed the role of universities in scientific and technological innovation, exploitation, and economic regeneration, and has worked for many years to widen participation in science and achieve knowledge transfer from higher education to business. And she, of course, serves as vice chancellor for the University of Bath. Uh, she will be speaking on the future of higher education leadership, so pay attention. <laughs> Dr. John Wood. Another friend of ours from long back is Secretary General of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. He has held academic posts at the Open University, University of Nottingham, Oxford University, and Imperial College London. Dr. Wood was a founding member of the European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, becoming chair in 2004. It's too much, John. It's simply too much. Uh, uh, without further ado, I would like to swap the order of speakers, inviting um, uh, Michael to um, uh, head the session off, uh, asking Alan Goodman uh, to round the session up. So Michael, would you please step up? Thank you. Thank you, Jason, and uh, good morning, and I should say happy birthday. 
Uh, just a week ago at the University Church here in Oxford, there was a memorial service for A.H. Halsey. Um, Halsey was a sociologist and an architect of the English comprehensive school system. And he also made programmes for BBC Radio, which is where I met him as a young producer. We made three programmes together, uh, all of them rather grand, actually. Uh, one was a documentary about the good city, and we got badly bogged down, I remember, in the Korean grocer community in New York. <laughs> and two discussions, uh, one on church and state, and the other on the future of universities. And his last major book, written in 1995, was also about universities. So there you see it, The Decline of Donish Dominion. Um, I should say that if I'd been Halsey's editor too, as well as his radio producer, I'd have found a more cheerful title. Um, it is a lament uh, for academics and their slackening authority, but it's also a millennial work that looks ahead to the expansion of higher education and the creation of a learning society. So the traditional and familiar face of the university, he wrote, could vanish under the manifold forms of the learning society. But the essential idea of a university will remain and find new expressions, probably with new structures, wherever civilization exists. Well, Halsey was also an architect of SERI, the Centre for Educational Research and Innovation at the OECD. And SERI too, just a year or two after the millennium, set the evolution of universities against this backdrop of a learning society. So um, in this intimidating uh, but admirable slide, um, the vertical axis represents the intensity of learning in your society. So from advanced knowledge economies high to agricultural and industrial economies low. The horizontal axis represents the way knowledge is controlled in your society through the stratification of expertise, through gateways to knowledge open and closed, and through ways of signalling what knowledge people have. Well, the 20th century tertiary sector uh, gets planted firmly bottom left. Universities complicit in a hierarchical technocracy in an industrial society conferring status, but only on the few. Um, all hopes, according to Seri, are top right. That's the 21st century learning society, where everyone's learning all the time, largely online, and where the role of the tertiary sector is to broker between learners and learning providers and to validate what learners learn. Do that, according to Seri, or you'll wither on the vine. Well, just a few years on, not many, I suppose, from Halsey's book and Seri's charts, I'd say the learning society has demonstrably arrived, at least in this sense that successful organisations, manufacturing or services organisations, develop new knowledge through research and provide continuing education for their people. That's how they create value. That's how they invest in the future. Not that the learning society is where everyone lives, uh, around the world, or even here in England. But as a broad characterization of the way many of us work and spend our, our leisure time, that learning society label neatly captures the story. So what then about universities and other higher education institutions? Brokers and validators, or withering on the vine? Uh, and I suppose that's a story you could say was now starting to play out on the long road uh, and slightly unaccountable road to 2065. I suppose there are three factors that you might say, uh, larger factors at least, that are shaping the future role of universities. The first is demand. Um, these are the OECD's latest production, projections. Uh, some of you will be familiar with them, with them. But they say that 300 million people will be consuming higher education by 2030, compared with 137 million in 2013, with India and China accounting for much of that growth, but by no means all. The second factor has to be the growing dissatisfaction of students and employers with the provision of higher education. Um, this is The Economist 
um, writing in March and looking mainly at American universities and handing down the heaviest sentence on the economist's statute book, market failure. <laughs> A market failure in higher education, um, escalating fees, uh, collapsing graduate premium, a failure to benchmark learning outcomes, and neither students nor employers really knowing the value of what they're buying, says the economist. And then the avalanche, the avalanche of change is coming. I suppose this is the third factor of technology, um, and to some extent Nigel Thrift talked about this. Um, technology disaggregating the traditional functions of the university and forcing universities to choose between a set of models. Could be global elite, uh, luxury brand, uh, could be mass education, could be niche, could be local. Well, it seems to me that taken together, those models could both meet escalating demand and strengthen the quality of teaching and learning. But it's less clear that they'll evolve to play the roles that Seri foresaw of brokerage and validation in a fully mature learning society. And for that, I suspect we might need a different model altogether to incubate these new roles and in turn to influence the sector as a whole. So the new model, in my language, would be the integrated university at the heart of an education and business ecosystem. This is a university co-created with business bringing together educational institutions, schools and colleges with business enterprises, be they social enterprises or commercial enterprises, and public agencies. And running through the ecosystem are two processes intertwined here, but historically separate, which is to say the development of young talent and business innovation. And what brings these processes together into the double helix is project and problem-based learning young people learning through the deepest engagement over time with real business problems and opportunities. The university on this model acts as curator, orchestrator, broker and validator, a learning institution that facilitates the operation of the wider learning society. It shapes curriculum, teaching and assessment through successive learning phases, potentially from early years schooling into first jobs and it builds and validates pathways, combining formal and informal learning. Um, it seems to me that in advanced knowledge economies, the ecosystem concentrates probably on forms of economic development, whereas in emerging countries, it may well focus more on social development with a greater role for civil society. Thank you. Um, the foundations for this approach, you could say, are already in place. Um, going to have to click through 15 times, but don't despair. Um, a small but, keep going, uh, a small but um, growing number of science and technology institutions are building their provision systematically around project and problem-based learning in North America, in Europe, and in Asia. Three more to go. Four. Well done. Well done. Um, and now I'm on to the next slide. <laughs> it's exhausting. Um, here in England, we're developing the ecosystem concept for a new university. This is the new model for technology and engineering due to open in 2017. An interdisciplinary engineering curriculum buttressed by humanities, arts and social sciences and looking both to drive economic prosperity in Herefordshire in the west of England and to strengthen talent flows into engineering <coughs> nationally, especially in renewables and advanced manufacturing, um, and a couple of other areas. So, if it's starting to emerge, how might a model of this sort evolve over the next 50 years? Uh, well, partly, I think, by seeking to equip graduates with an increasingly sophisticated set of capabilities, and partly by working not just on a regional or national basis, but maybe a global one. Um, some of you may have seen this, but the B team is a group of global businesses led by Unilever and Virgin, and their aim is Plan B for a more sustainable and equitable global society. And at Davos in January, they launched their vision for the organization of tomorrow, reimagined for a Plan B world, driven by purpose, solving complex global problems, uh, by responsibility to encourage the long-term development of their people, and therefore driven by a new form of leadership. 
Um, my own research, as Jason mentioned, looks in detail at the characteristics of this emergent leadership. A global outlook, seeking out, reconciling different perspectives, uh, nurturing the next generation of talent, constantly explaining the bigger picture, and inventive, using digital technology to think through new services and new business models. Now, I don't know about your universities, but these are not, I think, the capabilities that most universities are building in their students today. Um, but a global form of the learning and innovation ecosystem could do exactly that. I imagine a leading global university working within a specific economic sector, reaching back into a set of outstanding school systems, Singapore, Boston, London, um, and closely linked to global businesses. Well, all this lies ahead, um, but if the center of gravity is to shift toward education and talent development, then I'd say there's a step that needs to be taken very soon and that's the effective benchmarking of learning outcomes on an international basis. Thank you. This analysis suggests that Japanese high school students know and can do as much today as Italians at university graduation. I hope I've <coughs> picked my nations wisely, given the composition of the audience. Um, but there's no transparent way to assess the quality of different institutions in teaching and learning, uh, usually within country, let alone between. And yet, universities surely need data to build on their strengths and address their weaknesses. Governments surely need data to determine policy and funding priorities. Employers constantly say they want data to assess the value of the qualifications they see from different universities. And very importantly, students, increasingly the people playing, paying the money, definitely need data. Well, the OECD's proposal for the international assessment of learning outcomes in higher education would address this problem head on. But leading universities in America and Britain are contesting it, I should say, especially research universities, um, citing methodological objections. But I would say that a halo or something similar has to be a vital uh, development. And I leave immediately after these remarks, I'm afraid, for Mexico uh, to go on making that case. The index, uh, though the Mexicans are making it to the rest of the world and very much want to do it, I should say, the index would begin in today's world, assessing, for example, what students know and can do in economics, in engineering, but it would quickly evolve to assess the capabilities that global companies are calling for, including leadership. Well, um, it's sometimes said that the university can be the leading institution of the 21st century. I think that's right, but I also think it would require an evolution of the current model, and I've tried to sketch one version of that evolution. Um, there are, as you will know, many more revolutionary accounts of that future than the one that I've laid out. Um, but even so, many, and perhaps some of you, would say that a university interlocked in the way that I've described with business risks all we care about, the rigor, the independence codified in the 18th century enlightenment. Um, I don't see it that way, uh, as the acquisition of, for, of existing learning and the pursuit of new learning becomes pervasive across all kinds of organizations. I see the university as engaged and embedded in that broader ecosystem at the heart of the learning society. Last slide. But to end with A.H. Halsey uh, down the road, at Nuffield College, the university is the realization of one single idea, the idea of a social institution to ensure the continuity of intellectual work. And like Halsey, I think we should not put limits on the form that institution could take. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like now to call Dame Glynis up, please. Thank you, Chair. It's a privilege to be invited to speak at this conference whose object is to look ahead to the next 50 years of global higher education. However, it is a jolly dangerous task. 
It's difficult to see into the future that far ahead, and we've already said that this morning. Would we have been able to predict the changes that have been significant in or to higher education globally over the last 50 years if we'd been asked to do so 50 years ago? I doubt it. I looked back at the massive changes that have affected the way higher education is conceptualized, organized, and financed, all that have affected what it offers its students and what research it conducts and how it conducts it. And I looked at that set of changes since the inception of IAUP in 1965. It took a long time, as you might imagine, but I'll, I'll highlight a few of those changes. Mao Zedong, chairman of the Communist Party, had not yet then launched the Cultural Revolution. That occurred in 66. Christian Barnard had not performed the first heart transplant in South Africa. That was 67. Martin Luther King had not been assassinated in Memphis. That was 68. And the Soviet Union had not invaded Czechoslovakia in reaction to the Prague Spring. That was also in 1968. Neil Armstrong had not set foot on the moon. We had an example of an um, astronaut earlier being mentioned. But that was actually in 69. The UK Open University, which is reminiscent of many of the things we've been talking about already this morning, was not in existence. That was started in 1971. The United Arab Emirates was not established. That was also in 71. The first ever mobile telephone call had not been made. Some of you might think that was a good thing. Um, that, was in, that was in 1972. And that was by a, a Motorola engineer called Martin Cooper. I thought you would like to know that. He was in New York at the time. The Vietnam War had not ended. That was in 75. Apple Computer Company had not been established that was in 76. The first test tube baby had not been born. That was in 78. The Shah of Iran had not been driven into exile and all that followed. That was 79. Rhodesia had not gained independence from the UK. That was in 80. The first case of AIDS in the United States had not been diagnosed. That was in 1980. The space shuttle Challenger had not exploded. That was in 86, and also in 86, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded. The Berlin Wall had not fallen. That was in 89. Um, Sir Timothy Berners-Lee's had not invented the World Wide Web. Uh, some people challenge whether Tim actually did invent the World Wide Web, but if he did, it was in 1990. Um, the first Gulf War had not occurred, that was in 1990. The Soviet Union had not been dissolved, that was in 91. And the Bosnian War was in 92. The European Union had not been established, that was in 93. I was surprised at that personally, I thought it was earlier than that somehow, given its influence on UK's politics. Apartheid had not been ended, that was in 94. The first successful cloning of an animal had not occurred. That was Dolly the sheep, and that was in 96. The UN had not adopted the Kyoto Protocol on global warming. That was 97. Google had not been founded. That was 98. And Wikipedia followed in 01. And of course, we had 9-11 and the war on terror and all that followed and the terrible acts of violence internationally, including in the UK, 2005, the London bombings. We didn't have social media. Facebook didn't start until 2004. Um, and, of course, we hadn't had the stock market crash and global recession of 2008. Now, I could go on, but it seems like a good point to stop since Jason's counting me in here, since we are all continuing, I think, to feel the consequences of that financial crisis. 
I'm sure that you can all think of additional momentous events that have been globally significant over the last 50 years and which have been enormously impactful on higher education. I would hazard a guess that demographic changes, size and structure of populations globally, and shifts in international mobility would pervade much of your thinking. Of course, alongside these would be the changes in communication technologies. And frankly, we've heard a lot about that this morning. Ironically, I probably omitted the most obvious change, and that is in the number of higher education institutions. Many of your own institutions, I would suspect, would not have existed 50 years ago. My own actually received its royal charter in 1966, so we celebrate our 50th next year. The questions I would ask are these. Would you have predicted 50 years before they occurred the events that I have listed? If you had, would you have pre predicted their implications, not just their immediate implications, but their ramifications over the following 50 years? My instinct, and I have absolutely no empirical proof, is that we would all be rather poor soothsayers. Crystal balls are unreliable and dangerous things. Even providing accurate analysis of what is currently happening is hard enough and impossible on any global scale. Where does that take us on an occasion like this where we are challenged to think about the future? For me, it points to the one certainty for higher education, and that is the certainty of uncertainty. The one predictable thing that lies in our joint futures is that change will occur and that we, as leaders of institutions, will be asked to navigate a path through changes in society, whether economic, political, or technological, and in the knowledge base that underpins our educational activities. We and our successors will be required to design models for the operation of higher education that articulate with the, the changes that are occurring around us, despite uncertainty. This leads me to my prime argument, and it's a very simple one. We need to be preparing the future leaders of higher education to succeed amidst uncertainty. We can debate what skills are needed, what types of people will be good leaders. You will all have your own opinion. For what it's worth, I think we need heads of institutions who are not only intellectually of the highest quality, which of course I take as a given, including in your own instances, but also we will need excellent communicators, advocates for higher education in and outside of their institutions. We will need people who are politically adept. We will need people who are culturally aware, open and comfortable transculturally. We will need people who are effectively the conductors of orchestras, capable of molding and working a team to deliver an institution's goals. They do not have to play every instrument themselves, far from it, but they must be able to produce the symphony with the instruments that they have available to them. In terms of personal qualities, well, I believe that higher education leaders have to be value-led. Amidst uncertainty, without a firm value base, it's easy to get lost. But they also need determination, energy and humour. Uh, and I'm sure that you all recognize that. I know that you would add to and possibly completely change the list that I've generated. The important thing, I believe, is not to establish hard and fast expectations about what is needed in higher education leaders. The important thing is to recognize the need to support institutions, to identify and to develop those who have potential as leaders. If we, as leaders of institutions, do not do this, there is every chance that we will not have the people ready to take on those roles successfully as the challenges of the next 50 years 
materialise. There are some things which have been introduced within higher education, and in the UK, the Leadership Foundation for Higher Education is one of them, designed to support leadership development. I'm a director of the Leadership Foundation. Yet I fear that we are doing too little, way too little. What we do is unsystematic and is inadequately internationalised. The positive comment on which I close is that it would be easy to do more and to do more effectively. It just requires focus on this issue, and I hope you can do that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jason, for the introduction, and welcome to Oxford. Welcome to Trinity. Oxford's my home city where I was brought up, and my mother still lives just by Blenheim Palace if you're going down that way. So uh, call in for a cup of coffee. She's 95 and blind, so she probably won't recognize you. Um, but there we go. I've got quite a lot to say, uh, and just to put up a few things. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't know what to talk about at all. Jason kept bugging me and I kept uh, ignoring his bugs. But I, I thought I'd look at one great challenge that's coming up. But having heard all the other talks that I've heard this morning, I wish I could talk about those as well. But yeah, you want lunch, so we better move on. But one thing I'm going to talk about is my role as co-chair of the Global Research Data Alliance. And a little bit just to start with about the ACU. So next week, we've got to go to lots of slides. Um, this is the only one. Welcome to your 50th anniversary. It's nice to see you youngsters come on board. We're 102 <laughs> years old. Uh, and if you weren't fortunate enough to be conquered by us, well, sorry about that. We obviously missed out. To, um, we're going strong. We have about 550 members. And just two weeks ago, we were in South Africa looking at the impact of universities uh, and university research on global challenges. So I think you've all been talking about that as well. Next, please. Um, I'm a futurologist, but I get everything wrong, so that's why they employ me. I chaired the European Research Area Board in 2009, and we said, what will European Research Area look like in 2030? Okay, and we talked about creating a new renaissance. What is the renaissance of uh, education? What is the renaissance of um, uh, 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 science? And, and we talk about science here, we mean scholarship, wisdom. And we heard about reason, I think, earlier on. And the then Commissioner Janusz Potocznik from Slovenia said, we need to develop a more holistic way of thinking, bringing disciplines together to tackle whole body problems that are in front of the world. How do we do that? We've moved more, uh, 100, 150 years ago, a university like this was not, treat I'm a nanotechnologist, by the way, was not treating somebody like me who moves atoms around, but was looking at a much more global view of what was going on. I could sit here in one of these stuffy rooms and think, now, oh, isn't that a novel idea? Um, certainly when I was uh, Dean of Engineering at Nottingham, all my uh, professors used to say, can we have time to think, please? Thank time to think. So I think, too, we need to look at what this really means for us. And we're starting to develop. Next, please. Um, there's another study which the European Parliament put out about the same time uh, called Citizens in an Interconnected World, Global Trends 2030. Now, I can only get to 2030. I, I'm bogged down at this point. Um, but if the next one, please, just shows you about the three main global trends emerging today that will shape the world in 2030. The empowerment of individuals, which contributes to a sense of belonging to a single human community. Is that true? We've heard about the, the conflict, we've heard about wars. What, is that going to be true? Greater stress on sustainable development against the background of greater resource scarcity and persistent poverty, compounded, compounded by the consequences of climate change. Definitely true. And the emergence of a more polycentric world characterized by a shift of power away from states and growing governance gaps as the mechanisms for interstate relations fail to respond adequately to global public demands. I think our world today is showing that is getting worse and worse. So I, I commend this to you. They've just updated it, actually. I haven't had time to read it. And if you want it, and uh, it's just come out. Uh, next, please. Um, OK, what are the major paradigm changes? Well, I suspect you've talked about all these things, so I won't go through them. But I think one of them is the power of the citizen and the concept of scientific democracy. And how we as universities are going to play into this, rather than be ivory towers, how do we actually interconnect into this world? And perhaps um, the first speaker in this session probably started to talk about that. And a university is a direct contributor into the local country's economy. 
And what is the concept of place in the future, in this interconnected world? Okay, well, this is the interconnections that we use. In Europe, it's called Géant, Géant 2. And now, in Africa, and I've just been in South Africa, they said that up the West Coast there, and up the East Coast, they have as much broadband capacity as we do ha have here in the UK and in mar large parts of the US. Canada has more, actually, in some parts. Um, okay, and this is going to transform research and education in some of those areas. This is Mudzlet, which is down in South Africa. That line going down the west coast, which is really there to, uh, as we'll see in a little while, to service um, radio telescopes, has a major impact much, much higher than that. Next, please. And here's the citizen cyber science stuff. Uh, these are, when we had an empire, before my time, um, uh, <laughs> the captains would log the weather patterns. And these have all been digitized, they're available to you now. There's 40,000 people accessing those data, not just to uh, see what the weather was like, but to compare those data with global uh, climate change models, but also to find out what their ancestors were doing on board when they went to dances and other things. Incredibly powerful things. The best known one is, of course, is, um, uh, is the, um, uh, the telescope, come on, Hubble one. Um, anyway, you can get more on zooniverse.com if you want to see what's going on. Terrifically, there's one project on snails, which I would like. Next, please. Um, and this shows you some of the diversity of things, looking for Bushman uh, movement in, in uh, uh, southern Africa, looking at uh, energy in uh, China, and so on. These are cost-cutting things which start to bring in this holistic view of what's going on. Okay, and central to this, a lot of it is what research infrastructures. And as Jason said, I used to chair... Uh, the Research Infrastructures for Europe uh, group, and we saw all these as linked in. Now, you think, next, of research infrastructures as looking like this. This is my old lab, just down the road, uh, 12 miles away, the Rutherford Appleton lab, and my son is working there somewhere. Um, uh, synchrotrons, neutron sources, laser sources, uh, 200 instruments in space, linked to CERN, and that is where the whole academic network starts from in the UK. Okay, a digger went through the uh, road one day and I had 20,000 phone calls from indignant people. But apart from that, that's what you think of. Um, to, uh, you click on an app, next. It pops up to the European Space Station, uh, Space Agency, one of the satellites, next. It goes down, it gets buzzed down to CERN, who do the data analysis, next. And then you share all the data, okay? You, all you need is one of these and you're off, okay? And that is happening now. Uh, what's it gonna be like when we get to 10G phones? Huh? Anyway, next. Um, and then next. Okay, now the biggest thing, pushing things in Africa is the square kilometer array. Uh, some 600 plus telescopes spread over eight countries in Southern Africa and also in Australia and possibly to New Zealand, I think. I'm not sure if New Zealand's still in on the act. About 40 countries involved. Uh, and if you're in my act, neck of the woods, 14 um, members of the Commonwealth are. Okay, next. Now, get these figures. The data collected by the SKA in a single day will take nearly two million years to play back on an iPod. Apple, out of business. Okay, next. Okay, ten times the internet traffic that we have today. And that will be in 2025. We haven't even got the 2030 yet. This is one of about 20 projects which will have the same data rates. Okay and they're all going to start interacting together because that's what's happening. I haven't got time to take you through it. Here's a slide that Jim Gray put together saying we had a, a thousand years of experimental sciences, then we moved into theoretical sciences for a, a few hundred years, and then the last few decades, computational science, and now data-intensive science. And it's happening so fast. The last five years has been so dramatic in the way the changes have, uh, have gone through. Now, I'm a consultant at CERN. I don't know why they showed this slide with all the snow, but for those of you who don't come from snowy places, maybe you like it. The the thing about CERN is it's not just about the Large Hadron Collider. It's a great resource. I took a bunch of um, lawyers there and bankers from the City of London. They went into the canteen and they saw 2,000 youngsters arguing, shouting and talking. So I now call it the Large Had uh, Human Collider. Okay, the Large Human Collider. Remember that, LHC is not the Hadron Collider, it's the Human Collider. But here they're doing work on uh, t developing technologies for conflict regions. They're looking at do working with autistic children. A whole host of things where these people come together. Next, please. But their data rates are frightening now. If you don't know, this is from the LHC. The data coming out is 50 petabytes a year. Now, if you have no idea what a petabyte looks like, in old-fashioned units, one petabyte is one kilometer high of CDs. 
50 kilometers high of processed data a year now. Okay, this is peanuts. Okay, next. How are you going to work in this environment? How are you going to teach students? What is truth? What is truth? And what is wisdom in the cloud? How do you know? And this is some of the issues we're facing up to. How do you do this? I'm, I'm really struggling on this one, very exciting. So I chaired this report called uh, Riding the Wave, and this was written in 2010, about what we can do about it. And as a result of that, uh, the uh, European Commission, the Australian government, and the National Science Foundation, and now the NIH, have joined together to form what is called the Research Data Alliance. And I'm glad to say Japan, through the Science and Technology Council, is likely to be involved. Our next plenary is in, uh, is in Tokyo. Uh, and in here, we talk about global collaboratives. Again, looking at the grand challenges of climate change, feeding the world, and all the rest of it. It's not just a bunch of computer nerds, although there are quite a few of those as well. Um, please. Uh, I see one of my role is keeping them away from civilization. Um, okay, and we see data now as an infrastructure itself, a global infrastructure for the grand challenges before us. Okay, so we formed this two years ago, the Research Data Alliance. Somebody from the NSF said, let's just get on with it. We can't wait for governments. It's just too important. So we formed this, and just last year, I produced a follow-up report called the Data Harvest, uh, about how sharing research, uh, sorry, that should be data, can yield knowledge, jobs, and growth. It's about utilizing what we've got for the future. The biggest discussion we had here was on the color of the sky, by the way. Um, that's how the academics like to work. Next, please. And part of this is about how do we build trust. I do think this is an opportunity which cuts through all countries, governments, and other things to build trust. How are we going to do it? Um, this is the quote from my co-chair, Fran Behrman, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. It's fairly clear that in the 21st century, data drives everything from health services to climate change. But there's only so far you can go in solving the problems using your own data and your own team. Today, you need to reach across boundaries, and that is incredibly true. And so, well, I can go through the benefits, the citizen, the entrepreneur, the scientist or researcher, um, and so this was all done to, to appease the European Parliament, so we, we've got to talk about jobs all the time. Nobody's interested in knowledge anymore. Okay, so that was it of acting now, because it's happening now. Next, please. Okay, and there are costs, of course. Oh, by the way, it's my data, and I'm not going to let you have it. Oh, I pay for it. Ah, next. Okay, this is showing you how the RDA has grown in two years. It's almost 3,000 people now involved in 99 countries across the world. Amazing speed of movement. I've never seen anything like it in my whole academic career. But look at the groups that are forming. These are self-help groups, all bottom-up. Wheat data interoperability. This is looking at growing wheat, new types of wheat, in arid regions to feed the world. Bio-sharing data. My own area of material science at the top there. Marine looking at fish stocks and fish patterns as global changes in the tides uh, take place. Okay, this is the, inter uh, the agricultural one. I won't go through it, but this is a very dynamic group that's just self-formed around the world. It's completely open. It's open science. You have to share. You have to share by being a member. Almost there now. So how will universities cope with this situation in 2065? It's time to act now. And frankly, it's over to you guys and to those that you lead uh, uh, and, and take forward. And I see my daughter who's just finishing her PhD in the other place, in East Anglia, the opposite to here. Uh, uh, and I ask her, how are you going to cope in this? She said, Dad, I have no idea. But we've got to see this coming through, that we share our information across the world if this world is to survive when we move to 9 million people. And finally, this is the European Southern Observatory in Chile, which I had the privilege of going to. <coughs> I think we have to have a vision for the future. We've heard about a lot of the issues. Let's have a vision that really takes us, transcends us out of where we are now and inspires students for the future. So thanks very much for inviting me. <laughs> I'd like now to call Alan Goodman. Uh, no, map. This is a book 
Uh, I will explain how it's used in just a minute. Uh, <laughs> and, and while uh, Sir Nigel is right about so many things, and I'm sure he will be right about many of his forecasts, I'm really happy that uh, Fairleigh Dickinson and IAUP decided not to abandon the luxury model for at least this commemoration and that we had the privilege of seeing Roxton and now being hosted here at Trinity. Uh, when Jason first pursued me to give a talk um, at, at your commemoration, he did it on the basis not of our friendship, but on the fact that at the time, the Institute's president, a man named Ken Holland, uh, also spoke at the commemoration, and he wanted to have that parallel. As Alvaro mentioned, so many of the things we're doing parallels that. Uh, uh, I looked in our archives for Ken Holland's speech, and of course couldn't find them. We only have 18 million records and it was a little difficult. To... But Jason had the book. And I was struck, and I'm going to make just three points in my very brief remarks. The first is I was struck in reading the book that every time Ken Holland was mentioned, he was mentioned as an international educator. There was the historian Arnold Toynbee, the philanthropist J. Paul Getty, the professor of this, the professor of that. But Holland occupied that space called international educator. Um, it's a tough space to occupy. We would, in my field, be better off if we were directors of centers for international relations, uh, professors of political science, professors of international law, uh, something that fit into an academic discipline because it's pretty clear in 1965 international education didn't fit. And I would say it still doesn't fit in American higher education. Uh, uh, it is not, we have not yet changed the paradigm, certainly in America and I think perhaps globally, to say that you can't be educated unless international is a part of your education. And international education and international educators really have a very difficult time fitting into institutions. Uh, about the only thing you can say about what Ken Holland achieved uh, for us is that he came after the historian Arnold Toynbee and before the philanthropist J. Paul Getty in the book. Uh, and that is our dilemma for the rest of the next 50 years. Where does international education fit? Margarita uh, is at the American Council on Education. Every five years they do a survey of where internationalization fits in American higher education. Uh, right after 9-11, they completed the first sur survey, and it showed of the members responding, uh, only about 35% of American colleges and universities mentioned internationalization or globalization as part of their strategic plan. Five years later, they did a second look at it. I was sure by then the number would exceed 50%. It actually went from 35% to 38 percent. In 2012, it went to a little over 40 percent. Now, ACE is a big organization in America, 1,200 members. We have 4,000 colleges and universities. So it doesn't encompass every college or university in America. And only about 600 of the 1,200 members responded to the survey. So when I say a little more than 40 percent, think internationalization is important. There is an awful lot of at least American higher education where internationalization has not yet achieved any status or a priority. So that's the first observation. I, I think IAUP is highly relevant to my field because it's helping international educators find where they can fit with your field. The second thing I would notice is in, in, in Ken Holland's speech, he had one sentence that really grabbed me. He said in 1965, very few American university students take any work which would acquaint them with other countries or international affairs, 
And I suspect he went on to say this is also the case in other countries. Certainly in my own country, the absence of deep knowledge of international affairs by our students is very telling. Uh, today, half of college-educated Americans can't find Syria on a map. That's kind of the good news. The bad news is that 75 percent can't find Iran or Israel on a map. Seventy-five percent uh, think that uh, Paris is not the capital of France anymore. <laughs> Three-quarters of those in another survey, college-educated uh, American students in college, uh, believed that the population of the United States was somewhere between 750 million <laughs> and 2 billion. And three-quarters believe that the newest member of the United Nations, uh, South Sudan, is a country either in Southeast Asia or South America. <laughs> so the second observation is we have a really long way to go to make a deep understanding of the world we share, even in the American Academy, something that is part of what it means to be educated. I've asked Sarah to pass out some orange handouts which describe our moonshot. And I appreciate, John, you sowing some space views and some science because uh, what we've committed to do at the Institute is to try to double the number of Americans who study abroad between now and the end of this decade. It's a very difficult challenge. We hope to go from 300,000 to 600,000. Uh, over uh, 35 of your members have joined us as commitment partners. Uh, and we really need more of the IAP institutions to join us because if we succeed in getting 600,000 Americans to study abroad by 2019, 2020, uh, we can't send them all to Great Britain because that's where most Americans these days still tend to go. So we welcome IAUP members as commitment partners, especially in non-British destinations, uh, because we need more places for more Americans to actually experience the world. If we succeed, uh, it'll still be a pitiful result. Today, only a little over 1% of Americans in higher education have any educational experience outside the United States. If we double that number, we'll get to a little over 2%. And I'd argue that that's still not uh, a sufficient number for the kind of society we're hoping to build and the kind of education we're going to offer. So a second observation about between now and 2065 is that just as finding a place for international education in the academy is still going to be difficult, finding ways to help Americans really embrace this by actually going someplace beyond America is going to be a continuing challenge. As I mentioned, this is a book. Uh, it opens and closes. It has no buttons other than that. Uh, but you might notice the title. Uh, it's a parent's guide to study abroad. And one of the things we've learned in doing our research for generations study abroad is that sometimes the obstacle is money, sometimes the obstacle, obstacle is the academic calendar, sometimes the obstacle is transfer of credits, and oftentimes the obstacle is the parent who is not quite sure why, for example, a first-generation college student ought to now leave the place they tried so hard to get into and go to another country. Uh, in the past two days, I've had uh, many conversations with uh, Sheldon Drucker uh, at Fairleigh Dickinson and also with Jason yesterday, and, and you'd be surprised at how many times the word parent came up. <coughs> Parents call about things that might be dangerous at Roxton, things that might not be so comfortable at Roxton. And so it, it, it tells me that it's really important for our dialogue to include the parents. It may be important for IAUP if you're thinking about including students in 
some future meeting and dialogue to, to hear about parents because maybe there's an intergenerational gap that has to be addressed. But I want to present Jason with this book. We've produced it so that it costs only a dollar a copy because we want as many parents as possible to read it because we think that is also the key to doubling the numbers of studying abroad. You don't need batteries for it? It's, <laughs> it's confusing, but I'll sort, I'll sort it out. Fi final point, and I want to thank uh, Brendan O'Malley for giving part of my speech. Uh, some of you may, may know that um, we work very closely together in monitoring attacks on scholars, and also the Institute has a scholar rescue fund that helps on a global basis any any scholar in the world that's threatened by war, terrorism, repressive government. And it has been part of our mission since uh, 1919 when we were founded. Uh, we created an endowment in 2002, and since the time we've been keeping records uh, from 2002 onward, we've had 5,000 requests for help from over 100 countries. We've been able to make 900 grants to get scholars out of a dangerous place for a temporary period to a safe haven. As Bren Brendan mentioned, often we try not to place someone in the United States, but in the region where their <coughs> country is so that they can monitor the situation back home and, and return. And most of our scholars want to return, and about half, in fact, are able to return. Wars end, uh, terrorists are captured, repressive governments are ejected from office. Uh, uh, I'd say that's really the first part of uh, the history of Scholar Rescue. Uh, the second part is that we, and Elizabeth and her remarks, uh, I think foreshadowed this, uh, we're not going to find that all the scholars can go back in a two or three or four year period. The Syrian Civil War is going to take an awful lot longer than uh, a one or two year fellowship that we're able to provide. And, and so universities are going to need to function between now and 2065 a as havens for the national academies of the countries that are deadlocked in war, university systems closed, students have no place to go to get taught except uh, to ISIS, and we would all like an alternative to ISIS. And so the function of IAUP and the function of universities between now and 2065 may well be to not only welcome individual scholars, as we do and ask you to do now, but to welcome whole departments and whole academies and whole disciplines which need to be preserved and, uh, in the midst of much longer wars, as one of the speakers noticed. Uh, wars tend to be longer, especially in, in less wealthy countries these days. Uh, when we ended yesterday, uh, uh, Toyoshi m mentioned the poem or the song that uh, he found that was part of the end of the last uh, or, or the first IAUP conference. Uh, uh, and it made me think of uh, poetry also in relationship to universities. Uh, and, and England's poet laureate, uh, which so many commencements have quoted and so many commencement speakers always refer to that there are few earthly things more beautiful than a university, uh, was John Macefield. Uh, he actually didn't go to university, uh, but was given an honorary degree nevertheless in a place very much like this. And, and I, I think you have just to think of Roxton or Trinity or Oxford and, and realize how beautiful and special universities are. But, but that wasn't really what Macefield was talking about. He said universities are beautiful because in them those who hate ignorance strive to know, and they welcome thinkers in distress and in exile. And that's what really made universities beautiful, that they preserved knowledge, they preserved national academies, they 
welcomed thinkers in distress and exile. And, and whatever else we achieve technologically and financially for all of the universities here, my most profound wish is that uh, we remain beautiful uh, by welcoming thinkers in distress and thinkers in exile because as I look at the period ahead and in the Scholar Rescue Fund experience, we are really going to need that. With that, I'm going to ask uh, Sarah once again to pass out the blue sheets, and that will just give you a little history the past decade of Scholar Rescue, and most importantly, how you can help. If you know somebody in trouble, uh, let me know. If you can provide a haven for somebody in trouble, let us know. Uh, because we, we exist to save knowledge for the next 50 years and for the 100th commemoration. Thank you very much. Thank you.